I'm David Hammond, a longtime SME member and a geologist, engineer, mineral economist. Today I'm interviewing Douglas B. Silver as part of AIME's Oral History Project, part of AIME's mission to honor legacy and traditions of the Institute through preserving and promoting achievements in our fields and share prominent member stories for future generations. Throughout my uh, almost 50 year career in the mining industry, a seemingly constant uh, has been my longtime colleague, Douglas, uh, Doug Silver. Doug and I first met in the 1970s when we uh, were both uh, working for a company called Anaconda Minerals. Um, our professional and personal association continued across the ensuing decades. Uh, through collaboration on consulting projects, serving as each other's editors, uh, countless discussions about the industry and geology in general and mineral economics in particular. In the 2000s, I had the great privilege to be part of Doug's team in creating International Royalty Corporation, a successful public company with an innovative mineral royalty business model which reflected uh, one of Doug's many dreams. I have benefited without measure from our lifelong friendship, our memory partnerships, and our not infrequent humorous, although sometimes a tad sarcastic, interchanges. Uh, Doug is widely acknowledged as a major thought leader and visionary in the global minerals industry and is without peer. Today, we're going to review with Doug his long career in the minerals industry and ask him to share some of his many insights. Welcome, Doug. Let's start with your name. Last name of Silver is very minerals-like, but uh, Doug, there's a past tense of that, which is of dig. Um, and your license plate is Doug A.G. Yes. Uh, was this done deliberately? No, it, it was not intentional. Um, my parents wanted me to become either a lawyer or in marketing. So chronologically, it's correct. But I think mining's been around a lot longer than I have. <laughs> what kind of childhood did you have? I, I had a wonderful childhood. I was raised in a little town in New Jersey called Essex Fells, which is about 20 miles from New York City. And my parents gave me a phenomenal amount of freedom. When I, when I look back at how much freedom I had as a child, it was great. I spent a lot of times outdoors and I spent very little time watching TV. Hmm. Uh, How did your parents influence uh, your personality? My mother is where I get my infinite sense of curiosity from. She was always curious about everything and always coming up with projects for us to do. And she was also where I got my sense of humor from. Hmm. My father was a surgeon and uh, he worked very hard but he taught me how to be generous and give back. What are some of your fondest memories from that time? <laughs> um, never getting convicted, no. Yeah. I, uh, I had a, we had a, we used to go to Montauk, which is at the very end of Long Island every summer, and I would basically spend three months in shorts with no shoes on, walking the moors of Montauk, collecting things and fishing. And, uh, and as I got older, my dad got me a go-kart which was incredibly fun to drive around the neighborhood, even though it was illegal. And uh, then we had the famous creek. There was a creek about an eighth of a mile from the house that was maybe one foot wide and three inches deep. And I spent thousands of hours down there damming it up, playing in the water. It was a marvelous. <laughs> you should have been an engineer then. <laughs> okay, so here's the, uh, the standard must be asked questions for anybody as a geologist. Did you collect rocks as a kid? No, I did not. Uh, it was really quite interesting. My hero was Charles Darwin, and I was really impressed with his long travels and his abilities to decipher evolution. Um, my other science hero was the professor on Gilligan's Island, <laughs> who was amazing. This guy could make a short wave radio out of a coconut, but he couldn't patch a boat. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great mysteries in life, how that went. But he did impress me because he understood so many of the natural sciences, and, and that was very inspirational. Um, my family collected live animals. As a child, we had fish, cats, dogs, sheep, rabbits, gerbil, mice, rats, hamsters, skunks, 
raccoons, and we even had a monkey as a pet. So I collected animals as a kid, not rocks. <laughs>
And I spent the first six months there <laughs> looking for these iron mines to find out they were copper mines. So I think I got there through serendipity rather than through detailed research. <laughs> uh, how'd you find graduate school? Just like college, only with older people? No, no. Graduate school is quite different. And, and I don't think people realize it. A lot of people think graduate school is just another degree. But when you're in college, you're taking a lot of different courses because you're trying to find your way or where your passion lies. In graduate school, you determine that and the other people in your class are also in the same field. So the bonds I created with other grad students is far greater than the ones I created with undergraduates because we're all focused on basically the same subject. And to get into grad school, you had to have the grades, so you tended to work with really smart people. And, and if you've ever hung out with smart people, you always want to hang out with people smarter than you because you'll learn faster. Um, do you think that graduate school was your uh, main preparation for entering the real world of work? No. Um, graduate school for me really widened my knowledge of chemistry and physics. And I particularly like physical chemistry because it was so logical and it was so useful. I think that's the greatest value I got out of it. Uh, what was your MS um, uh, thesis topic? You know, it was groundbreaking. It was the thermodynamics of a shellite deposit in southern Arizona. I think I've heard of that. Maybe, maybe not. I'm still negotiating the movie rights after 40 <laughs> years. Okay, so now your first job um, was with Anaconda Copper Company. How did that come about? Well, it's quite interesting, you know, being raised in New Jersey, I've never worked in the mining industry. And so I'm arriving at a school where most of the grad students had done summer internships or temp jobs with the mining companies. So when the mining companies came around to interview us, I was at a huge disadvantage. And I had a really hard time getting my first job. But I was attending a conference in, uh, in, in Alta, Utah, and I met John King, who was a, a district manager for Anaconda. And apparently, I'm much better at interviews in bars than I am in, in <laughs> classrooms. <laughs> I think that's true of many folks in the mining industry. So uh, where was your first assignment with um, uh, Anaconda? What did you do? So in 1979, uh, John got me a scholarship and then gave me a summer job working in Rico, Colorado, which is really next door to Telluride in southern Colorado. And I understand um, from uh, our time together, Anaconda, that uh, you were involved with a fairly significant mineral discovery, uh, a, bit, uh, a, a bit quite deep. Yeah, so I was involved with the team that discovered the Silver Creek molybdenum, porphyry molybdenum deposit. And um, it was high grade, but yeah, it was kind of deep, like 4,000 feet. <laughs> so it was kind of like, you know, an operation was a success, but the patient died. <laughs> what happened uh, uh, after you and others made that discovery? Well, it was interesting because Atlantic Richfield, ARCO, had uh, purchased Anaconda, and they were really struggling to, to make Anaconda profitable. And so because of the discovery and because John King was my ultimate boss, uh, Anaconda decided to build the first ever standalone acquisition team in the mining industry. And John was put in charge of it, and so he had me promoted and brought to Denver to be on that team. What was the evolu evolution of the acquisition team uh, during the uh, remaining time of <clears throat> Anaconda? Well, the team was around until Arco let us all go. <laughs> but but for me, I was the junior member of a four-man team. I was about probably 25, 26 years old. And I got a phenomenal introduction, a PhD in how you do valuations and how you find deposits around the world. And I got to travel all over the world at, at Anaconda's expense. So for me, it was probably the best education I ever got. After a couple of years, they decided to rotate other younger people onto the team and so they gave me to uh, the vice president of, of exploration in North America, and I was his lieutenant, which basically mean I got his coffee and did his budgets and followed him around, which, again, was a, a tremendous learning experience in management. John, John Wilson was quite generous with his time, and 
I learned a great deal about how senior managements of failing copper companies make decisions. <laughs> um, I believe Art Barber was head of uh, that exploration unit at that time, wasn't he? Yeah, Art was in charge of both domestic and international exploration. He was the head guy, and uh, I count him as one of my mentors. He was uh, a real gentleman, and, and he taught me a great deal because, you know, when somebody was that high up in the organization, you always thought that they'd be really tough and really mean, and he was a, a true gentleman and, uh, and taught me a lot and was fun to hang out with. Great guy, although, man, could he edit a report. Headed. You should play poker with him. <laughs> he, he probably got enough to pay off his house, me playing poker with him. So I know that uh, you met your wife at Anaconda. Yes. Anaconda had a very strict rule against fraternization. And I think while I was in the Denver office, there was at least five or six couples that hooked up and got married, including my wife, who was a secretary in a different department. Uh, I remember that well. Uh, she was uh, actually the, I, in, in the department I was in. That's right. So. That's right. She was your secretary. I know uh, all of us kind of went through the, uh, the prog progression of the anaconda uh, demise. Uh, what lessons did you learn about getting laid off? <clears throat> well, what happened was when ARCO had enough of losing money on anaconda, they started layoffs. And I was caught on the third wave along with my wife. They let 700 of us go in Denver in one day, and it never even made the local papers. The problem that we had is we were recently married. My wife was about eight months pregnant. I had no network, and I was basically thrown out on the street. So it was um, it was a bit of a a bit of a terrifying time. So the, eventually, you did resolve that, and I believe the next uh, stop was Bond Gold. Yeah. Well, first thing about uh, getting laid off, you know, it's a terrifying experience, and I wouldn't I wouldn't put it on anybody. But the next morning you get up, the sun comes up, and you, and you really have a choice. You can, you can sit around and be depressed and mope, or you can get with the program and go find another job. So um, I always knew how to hustle because I was raised in New Jersey. But when you have a mortgage and a pregnant wife and, and everything else, it makes you work a lot harder. And the biggest takeaway from that is I assumed at Anaconda I'd be there for 30 years, get my gold watch, sit in a rocking chair. Um, you learn that corporations don't care about labor capital the way they do at asset capital. And, and networking is your best way to be protected. And, and that was a hard lesson, but it was a good one, that you need to network from day one and always assume you've got maybe a two- or three-year time window with the company you're working for. What was your process as you... Uh tried to resolve this situation? Well, it was very tough because I didn't know anybody. I, I mean, I'd only been in the business for a couple years. I went to a couple conferences, but I never really worked at networking. Ken Howard, who ran one of the sub-districts, uh, he got me a job with Naranda in Leadville sitting on a drill rig for the summer. And I used that time to start networking and start taking it seriously. It was, um, you know, I give him a lot of credit for, for paying my mortgage. So how did you end up uh, working for, uh, for Bond? Well, okay, this is talks about serendipity. So at, at, at Anaconda, um, we had been looking, the, the acquisition team had been looking at a project called Coliseum Gold, which was in California. And when they decided to get rid of us, they converted the acquisition team to a divestiture team. And there was an Australian company that purchased the project, and then they hired our team of which John King led it, and, and he brought me along. And so now I was working at Coliseum Gold Mine. I was the project geologist. I was working on reserve resource estimations. And the Australians got into a bit of trouble, and they sold the Coliseum Mine to the famous Alan Bond. A uh, very famous uh, name of the, of the 1970s <clears throat> and 80s in, uh, in Australia. Uh, he was one of the richest men in Australia. Tell me about him. Uh, uh, was he a good boss? Alan Bond was probably the best boss I had. He, was, he started his career as a house painter and got involved in real estate and made a great deal of money in real estate. 
And then he expanded and he went into the beer industry, which you know in Australia is a, a national pastime. And at one point he owned half of the beer industry in Australia. And then he, but he was in six or seven industries. He remembered everything that was going on. He played at a global level. And then his big moment of fame came in 1983 when he sponsored the sailboat in the America's Cup race that beat the Americans. Huh. And they, they beat him after 132 years of America winning. And that's when he got international prominence for doing that. Um, but he was a great boss because he was very decisive. He remembered stuff. I remember once I, I, he was asking me how the geology was going at Coliseum, and I gave him some answer. And then six months later, I saw him, and he asked me the same question. I gave him a different answer, and he corrected me. <laughs> it woke me up about, you've got to be careful with people with photographic memories. But because he owned the company, and we built Bond International Gold under him, because he owned the company, he didn't need committees. He would sit down with everybody, he would hear you out, and then he would make a call and, uh, and allowed us to move very quickly and be very nimble uh, in building the business. I um, believe that uh, Bond has had an IPO, a major fundraising effort for them, uh, and I understand you were pretty uh, uh, well involved in that. Uh, you can tell me about the roadshow and how much uh, did you raise? Okay, so I was the project geologist for Coliseum, which means I was going out to Las Vegas every couple of weeks to collect samples and keep it going. And Alan Bond had, had purchased basically the mining district of Kalgoorlie, and he and his team in Australia had developed what's now known as the Super Pit, which was a major contribution to the mining business. And he had purchased some other assets. So we were brought into Denver to present our projects to him. And Coliseum was the smallest project in the book. And when I got done with it, he was so impressed with my speaking style, he says, you're now head of investor relations. That must have been a real uh, uh, on-the-job training uh, thing, because I don't <laughs> believe you had a lot of background in that. Um, I had no background in that, uh, other than when I worked for the first Australians that bought Coliseum, we had gone out to do a fundraising across uh, North America and Europe. We went out to raise 38 million, and this would have been in the early, the mid 1980s, and we failed. And, and part of the reason we failed is obviously the story wasn't good enough, but also we were all young, young bucks, and uh, we'd go out in every city every night and party till late and get up and, and you know, we're exhausted for our talks. And you were doing seven or eight meetings a day, um, so we failed. So when Alan made me in charge of investor relations, I understood the, the wrong way to raise money. And now we we're out raising 300 million, which is the most um, that had ever been raised for a mining IPO in the New York Stock Exchange. So we made a point, we were in bed by nine o'clock, we behaved ourselves, we didn't drink much. And we also had the benefit that Alan had a, his own private 727 that could sleep 10 people. So we would fly in his jet from city to city where the investment bankers that are accompanying us got to stay in the airports waiting for delayed flights. It was marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> so um, was that effort uh, successful? The money raising effort was very successful. Um, the downside of it was that Alan needed the money for his other uh, ventures. And so he really pushed that we got the top IPO share price we could. And unfortunately, after the IPO, the share price never hit that level again. So we spent the next couple of years with the share price going down, and uh, that created a lot of problems. And was one of those problems um, your uh, departure from Bond? So as head of investor relations, I got to deal with investors every day. And as the share price continued to drop, the investors got more and more concerned, and some of them got downright angry. And uh, I was on a trip in Texas meeting one of our largest institutions and sat down, and they proceeded to grill me on everything we were doing wrong. And I did my best ability, professional ability, to answer all their questions and tell them what our options were, none of which were apparently acceptable to them, even though I had gone through every option that was available. Um, as a consequence, I got home and uh, they called up Goldman Sachs, who was our investment banker, and they said, heads got to roll. And because I was the junior member of the, of the management team, 
um, I was put up for sacrifice. <laughs> but but not to not to, to to say anything bad. Steve Everett, who the president was, um, Steve Everett's a good man. He gave me a marvelous severance package, and uh, but I I took one for the team. So I guess uh, you uh, learned uh, again on the job that. Uh, building a public company is as hard as uh, many people say. Yes, you know, it's a lot of work, but if you're successful, you can make a lot of money. You know, now that I've been working in private equity and, uh, and, and have retired, so I'm in private life, if I had a choice, I would probably try to stay private because there's a lot less regulation and you don't have investors who are second guessing every one of your moves. By the way, what happened to Bond International Gold? Um, after I left, uh, Bond was sold to Lack Minerals, and Lack Minerals subsequently was acquired by uh, Barrick Gold. Um, but during our time that I was with Bond, we built the Coliseum Mine, we built the Golden Patricia Mine, we built the Bullfrog Mine, the Richmond Hill Mine, and we invented the Kalgoorlie Super Pit. So it was an amazing time for the mining industry with how many new mines. We were the fourth largest North American gold producer when we were uh, up and running on all the cylinders. Wow, and the, uh, the super pit at Calgary is, is still going um, out there. Uh, so what's, what did you take away? What's your biggest lesson that you learned from your time with Bond? I think there was two really critical lessons. One is having a benevolent dictator as your boss is really good because he took good care of his workers because he depended on us, but he didn't suffer fools and he made decisions quickly. The second is one of the things that is often missed in investor relations is don't lie to investors. Investor relations people have this tendency to always promote the company and only tell the good. And I had a, a, one of the greatest analysts in the New York market sit me down the first time he met me, and he said, tell me the good and the bad, and if you do, when things go bad, we'll probably give you more leeway because we know you're being honest. And it's always been a message I've carried through my whole career. Just tell people the way it is, and I'm sorry if it's negative information, but I'm being honest with you, and we'll work through the problem together. I think it was during the, your time with Bond that uh, you founded the Denver Gold Group, which is today is the most influential precious metals investment conference in the world. Uh, didn't you have enough on your plate? <laughs> yes, but you know, having, uh, having been laid off by Anaconda, one of the things I learned is you always have to have multiple irons in the fire. And even though I had this marvelous job at Bond Gold, I was always thinking about what if. And um, so the story behind that was that all the investment bankers would want to fly to Denver and meet with Steve Everett, our president, to pitch them on deals and try to earn commissions. And Steve really didn't want to meet with them because he just had such a huge workload. He was, the guy was buried. He was working 100-hour weeks. And so he gave me the job of triaging the, the investment bankers that he would meet with, um, which was you know, wonderful power. And so what I was thinking about is Denver didn't really have a vibrant mining industry at that point. We had a lot of mining people. I mean, Denver, Denver has been the center of the U.S. mining industry for decades, but we didn't have a big investor base in Denver. We just had a lot of companies. And so the deal that I cut with these people is I would get them a meeting with Steve if they would present to the Denver mining community about any subject they wanted. So it would allow the smaller Denver-based companies to get exposure and meet with the world's biggest investment bankers. And that's what formulated the idea of the Denver Gold Group was a way of getting investors to come to Denver since we didn't really have a financial community here the way that Toronto and Vancouver and New York have. Um, so that was the impetus for doing it. Following uh, uh, your uh, tenure with Bond, um, and I, I believe, what was that, around the, uh, that you left them in the uh, latter part of the 80s? Yes. Um, that's when you formed uh, Balfour Holdings, and I'm sure many folks uh, who know you still don't know where that name come for, came from. Balfour is for the letter B, which is my middle name. And... Uh, 
we have a lot of Scottish names in our family. And I used it because originally I was hoping to build my own investment company. So I wanted a vehicle where I could track my investments and start building a track record. Um, <clears throat> but I wasn't too good at that. <laughs> but because it sounded like a fancy investment company, I just kept it and, uh, and ended up using it as my consulting company name. So um, the uh, sort of the, the business plan uh, was for Balfour to be uh, primarily a consulting firm? Yes, but, but I, I had a business model that nobody had ever done before. And what I learned at Anaconda was that senior management was making decisions based on what they read in the Wall Street Journal that day. They weren't actually doing formal research, even though they had these massive strategic planning departments, as you know, yes. given that you were part of that world. Um, and, and what they needed is they needed somebody who would do quantitative research at the board level on whatever question they had. And so I set up Balfour to do that for these companies and um, built the, the vehicle in 1987 and I, I continue to still use it on occasion. What were the type of clients that you had and uh, what was the nature of uh, the project assignments that you would uh, yeah. uh, get in these engagements? Listen, my best clients are the ones who paid their bills. <laughs> and pretty much, if you know, if you've been in the consulting business, pretty much every year there'd be one or two that wouldn't pay their bills and there would go your profit. So consulting became a wonderful lifestyle. But what I would actually do is I would have, I had some wonderful assignments. I had assignments where, uh, a board of directors would call me and they'd say, hey, we got a board meeting in three weeks. Should we invest in Peru or should we invest in Mexico? And I'd have three weeks to put a white paper together. One major gold producer retained me after 9-11, like two days after 9-11, to figure out what 9-11 was going to do to the mining industry. Now, this was intellectually fascinating because I had no precedent. And they basically paid me to think about stuff for about three months about all the possible ripple effects and where it could go. And um, it was a wonderful assignment uh, because I had, I had to figure it all out. And, and I'm happy to say I think I got it right because when the pandemic hit, many of the same things I had predicted in 9-11, post 9-11, happened with the pandemic. So it made giving speeches about the pandemic a lot easier. I know that you also were do, started doing evaluation uh, work, and um, I know that uh, you eventually were actually doing formal appraisal work, How, and I know you're a certified minerals appraiser. How did that all kind of evolve? So when I was in the acquisition team at Anaconda, I learned about uh, business. I never took a course in college because I just wanted to be a really strong natural scientist. So I kind of got a lot of on-the-job training at Anaconda, and I really like doing valuation work. The, the idea that you could put a number on something intangible, like what a mine or deposit was working. And uh, when we had a, the downturn, um, nobody was doing business development, but people still needed valuation work. So I joined the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, which runs a two-year, eight-course eight uh, thing that trains you how to do rural appraisals. And each class was a week long. Most of the classes were a week long. And then you had a three hour exam at the end of it. And if you passed it, you could move on to the next year. So I did that for two years. And what it did is it put me into a very small group of people in the mining industry who knew mining and knew how to do appraisals. Most of the engineering companies that people use these days don't know the proper way to do appraisals. They're actually just doing valuations, but there's more to appraisals than that. And so it created a tremendous business opportunity for me because there were so few of us in the world that did these things. And um, I was lucky that I got to work with some of the world's largest mining companies doing internal appraisals, doing appraisals when they wanted to sell an asset and trying to figure out what they thought they could get. Um, was also involved when they were buying something, they would bring me in as a, as a fresh pair of eyes to tell them what it was worth. And it was a marvelous career. I did it for about 20 years and absolutely loved it. I know that uh, as a, um, a mineral uh, appraiser that uh, your 
uh, market approach to value uh, uh, techniques that, that you've used and everything are, uh, you're really uh, uh, the leading person uh, for that because your databases um, that are so critical. Uh, so did Belfort grow to a large uh, corporation or a large uh, consulting entity? No, Belfort grew to have a very large library. You know, back then we didn't really have the internet and so I got us on about 4,000 mailing lists and I would get three to four feet of mail a day and to Lee, who's, who's Ta's wife, Tu came in and she's been my business partner for over 20 years. And she had the lovely task of filing all that stuff. But uh, she also had the wonderful task of running my business so that I could do my appraisal work. When we closed Balfour in 2003, we had 78 filing cabinets of annual reports for mining companies, the largest in the world, second only to the government of Canada. But what I found is the market approach to me is the best of the three appraisal approaches because it's using real-time data of what the market will pay for things. And there was no organized effort to collect this data. So every day I'd get up and I'd download all of the press releases or read them through the magazines. I think we had, we had something like $15,000 of subscriptions and looking for new deals. And then I built a very detailed model on a mathematical model on how every deal was to be valued so that it all matched up at the end. And that's what really created the appraisal business for Balfour. I would have companies call me and they say, you know, Doug, we want to invest in Mexico. What are they paying per ounce of resource? And I was the guy with the numbers, the go-to guy with the numbers. And so monopolies are always preferred. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a very lucrative business. Well, I uh, certainly can attest to the size of the files, and uh, they, your databases have bailed me out uh, more than more than once, uh, particularly during my dissertation. Um, so, in collecting all these massive uh, amounts of data, uh, we understand what your purpose is, but um, uh, kind of what happened to that li the, the, the the database in the library? Yeah, it was kind of sad, you know, with the the invention of the internet. Uh, more and more things became digital. And uh, when I decided to close Balfour, um, I approached the major universities to see if they wanted the, the, the files, and nobody wanted 78 filing cabinets. So we ended up getting a 33-foot dumpster and paid my, uh, my son for a month's worth of emptying drawers and throwing them into a dumpster. And, and it's too bad because these files went back to the 1960s and I could pretty much look at any company's history, which again, when, when somebody buys another company, even that company, the targeted company, may not have their records going back that far. So it gave me a lot of in, useful information that nobody else had, but we ended up having to throw it out because nobody wanted it. It's really sad because uh, the average put into, into it, plus the, a lot of that older material, which someday someone's going to need to have, it's not been scanned. It's not out there in the uh, in the cloud anywhere. It's uh, basically lost. Yeah, you know, if I was doing that today, I would have shipped it all off to India and had them digitize it because you're right. You can't find those those files today. Um, I was not happy to get rid of it, but to your second question, I think it was a week after they took the dumpster away. Somebody called me saying, "Hey, do you have a happen to have a copy of this report?" And it's like, not anymore. <laughs>I know that there's been a number of times that you've testified uh, before Congress uh, and that uh, on, on various industry issues, mineral industry issues. Tell us about some of those. You know, the first time I, I got contacted by the subcommittee on, on energy and natural resources, you know, uh, there was so much civic pride. The idea that one, they think you know something, and, and that they actually want you to come and testify in Washington. It's really like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It's a tremendous honor, and the amount of time you put into writing your testimony and answering their questions is phenomenal. So my first presentation in Washington was in 1995, where I was discussing why capital wasn't flowing into the U.S. mining industry. I also have testified on the proposed changes to the Mining Law of 1872, and I've served, served as a friend of the court to the subcommittee on other issues, particularly on royalties, which, which we'll get into. What I found is that we experts, you know, we're considered qualified experts. 
We spend a lot of time and personal money to give them the best advice available. And you get into the session and they're sitting up on the Diaz looking down on you and the whole thing is filmed. And when you get done, uh, they don't really care. They, they, they put it away in a file. They claim it sets a foundation for the future. But in my 40 years, I've never seen how any of the multiple times I've testified has ever been used for anything. So a lot of it is just showmanship and getting the various senators on the mic, giving their piece for their constituents. But they really don't care. So the last time I got invited, I said no. Now, I don't know a lot of people who turned down a chance to speak to Congress. But it was so disappointing that all three of us who were invited said no. And because we were all pretty close to Denver, they moved the hearings to Denver so we would participate. Because we saw no point in spending money on airline flights. And they don't compensate. They didn't cover your cost. So they moved the hearing to Denver, and that was the last time I testified in Congress. Uh, the sort of, uh, sort of a kabuki theater, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs>
and uh, why you kind of moved from uh, Balfour Consulting to International Royalty. Um, consulting is a mar marvelous lifestyle, and, and I was paid a great deal. You know, I remember once one of my clients saying that I charge more per hour than their lawyers. And I said, well, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, I've had a thousand bad ideas in my life. And, and for all of you who are young and are listening to this, you're going to have a thousand bad ideas. But I had one good one, and that was international royalty. What happened there was I was getting ready to turn 50. My private research showed me that the Chinese super cycle was, was getting ready, was kicking in. Uh, you know, we're talking about 2000, 2002 in that range. Both of my kids were getting ready for college, and I knew I needed to make a lot of money, and I saw that the public equity markets were blowing wide open, and I thought, you know, if I'm ever gonna run a public company, now is the time to do it. And fortunately, right at that time, I was doing an appraisal on a royalty company. And it was fascinating, because I had never studied the royal industry, didn't really know much about it. And, um, about halfway through the appraisal process, which typically took about a month or a month and a half, uh, Royal Gold showed up and made a bid for this company. Well, the woman who owned 90% of the stock, she and her husband built this company and then he died quite unexpectedly and she was sort of stuck with this public company that she owned so much of. She approached me and asked me if I knew anything about acquisitions and sales. And I said, well, of course I did. I mean, come on, I was a consultant. We, we always say yes and then we figure out what that means. Uh, but, you know, I did have a lot of experience from the Anaconda acquisition team. So I quit appraising it and started serving as her negotiator. And I spent the next six or eight months negotiating the sale of her royalty company to Royal Gold. And in the process of it, I got a Ph.D. in the royalty industry because I had to go to each round of negotiations armed to the teeth to get her what she wanted. I'm happy to report that uh, she did get what she wanted. With creation of uh, this concept of uh, the royalty uh, company, uh, you went, uh, decided to be a, a public company. Uh, tell us a little bit about that versus trying to do it with private equity yeah. at that time. Okay, so here's, here's the dilemma. You're a consultant, which means you don't have a lot of money. You want to go build a public company, which costs a lot of money. So how do you do it? Well, it's quite easy. The first thing you do is you surround yourself with your friends who are seasoned professional at whatever skill sets you need, and you don't have to pay them. So the first thing I did was uh, Doug Hurst, who is a co-founder. He and George Young were the co-founders of International Royalty. Uh, Doug and I had known each other for years. He, like me, he was a geologist. He'd served as an analyst for some of the investment banks. He was a mineral economist like me by on-the-job training. And Doug and I kept running into each other at conferences and, and talking about the same subjects because he also built databases. It seems to be the purview of Doug's. We build big <laughs> databases. So I got together with him because I knew he'd have a list on his database and I had a list on my database. And then we got George Young, who is a lawyer, because all of this is very legal. Uh, we then expanded the team. We hired uh, Rennie Carrier, who was an expert on, on the Canadian stock exchanges, on compliance. Uh, uh, he was a former broker. He had, he had a massive number of skills. So I'd worked with Rennie before. I got Rennie on, on our board of directors. We got uh, Gord Fretwell, who was a securities lawyer. Um, uh, and then we added you know, Bob Schaefer, who had really good networks. Uh, he was with Kinross at the time. And, uh, and we just added people uh, to the board who would work for free or work for stock options or work for founder shares. And we, we basically built the company from that. We, um, we then went on the road to raise money. Doug, Doug Hurst found the first royalty, which was on Hemlo. Hemlo at that point, the royalty was kicking out about a half a million dollars a year, which for two consultants was an amazing amount of money. And it allowed us to shut our consulting practices down and go full time. So we went on the road and it was literally like what you see in the movies. We had been to 10 or 12 investment bankers. Everybody had turned us down. And we were on our last investment banker. We'd maxed out our credit cards. And we went to Haywood and met with John Tognetti, who was chairman. Got about two minutes into the discussion. He says, stop. And, uh, and he said, I'll take the deal. 
Wow. Uh, the sun did come up then. Oh, yeah. So we, we were able to buy the Hemlo royalty and, um, and then get ready in 2000. We did that in 2003. And then it took us about another year and a half to build the portfolio to the size that you could go public. And the way we did that is I went to all of my clients. I went to the BHPs and the Hecklas and, and all my clients and got them to sell me their portfolios. And, and again, we didn't have any money. <laughs> so uh, in the case of BHP, they were wonderful because I'd, I'd been their appraiser for years. Uh, they said, Doug, you don't have any money and you want to buy all these things. So I said, yeah, yeah, but I'm going public. And they, they said, okay, let us know when you're public and then you can buy our portfolio. So I got an option without having to put anything down, which was really nice. And I did that a couple times because of my personal relationships. And this, this goes back to this issue about networking and, and having very strong personal relationships with people. It, it makes a big difference in doing business, particularly if you don't have any money and you're, and you're trying to grow something. And uh, having a, a, a reputation of being smart and uh, playing by the rules and uh, uh, wanting to do some, uh, build value for uh, the investors. Yeah, I think there's a bigger lesson, though. And I don't think a lot of people think about this, but you're right. You want to be honest. You want to be professional. But if, um, if you hurt somebody or they perceive you've done them wrong, you create a bad will ambassador. And bad will ambassadors will tell anybody who will listen how you hurt them. Good will ambassadors will not. Goodwill ambassadors will only respond if, if somebody asks them a particular question. And so what happens is you accumulate bad will ambassadors, but the people who like you and like your product won't say anything about you unless they're asked. And this will greatly impact your ability for deal flow. You know, you and I have seen this where one of the mining companies will get a bad perception for whatever reason. And for a year or two, nobody will take them the good deals because they have a bad perception. And then their competitor who had a good perception will get all the deals. And then, and then the good company will do something wrong and, and become the bad one. And then we'll switch back to the other one. Um, we, we've seen this in business, but it's, it's really key that you treat people right and that you're honest and you're straightforward because you don't want those bad will ambassadors. They will hurt you in ways you won't see coming.